بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم This morning I'd like to discuss what's been called non-reductive religious pluralism and religious dialogue. First, I want to introduce the notion of different kinds of religious pluralism and what's meant by non-reductive religious pluralism. There are many different forms of religious pluralism. One way to divide the types of religious pluralism is with respect to values. A religious pluralist with respect to some value holds that there's a plurality of religions that have this value. Examples of values that might be considered are truth, spirituality, salvation, a way to nirvana, good moral teachings, good institutional organization, and many things that can be considered values that various religions can have. Sometimes the values are related to one another. If the truth will set you free, then the value of truth will enable one to achieve the value of liberation. The relations among values, however, are complex and they shouldn't be confused. Another way to divide types of religious pluralism is with regard to the extent to which different traditions have given some have some given value. Hegel, for example, thought that spiritual value could be found in each of the major religious traditions of the world, but that Christianity, and in particular Lutheran Christianity, and even more particularly Lutheran Christianity with Hegel's own philosophical interpretation, possesses this value in the highest degree. We could say that Hegel is some sort of religious pluralist with regard to spiritual value because he's willing to grant that there is spiritual value in a variety of religions. But he's not an equality pluralist since he holds that the measure of this value increases in dialectical progression leading to his own religious views. We could call Hegel a degree pluralist. Yet another division that may be made among religious pluralisms, they may be reductive or non-reductive. A reductive religious pluralist with respect to some value holds that a plurality of religions possess this value because they share the same common elements. Let's take, for example, the often discussed value of salvation. Those who are religious pluralists in this regard hold that more than one religion provides a means to salvation. Usually, it's claimed that the major religious traditions all provide a means to salvation. Equality pluralists hold that the various religious traditions they find acceptable all provide equally good ways of obtaining salvation. Equality pluralists with regard to salvation who are also reductive pluralists will hold that the various religions provide equally good ways to salvation because of some common set of elements that they share. Suppose, for example, that two of these elements are what Rudolf Otto 
called the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans. That is, a mystery that evokes trembling and awe, and one that evokes an overpowering attraction. Some might hold that any religion that has these two elements has sufficient means to provide the believer with a way to salvation. By the way, I don't mean to suggest that Otto would have endorsed this kind of view, but the example can help to clarify um, the distinctions described here. Anyway, it wouldn't matter how much Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans a religion has. Maybe one religion's a little heavier on the Tremendum side and another on the Fascinans side doesn't matter. As long as the basic elements are present, there's a way to salvation. On the other hand, one might be a reductive pluralist with regard to salvation, but not an equality pluralist. A degree pluralist will hold that as long as the basic elements are present, there's a way to salvation. But when the elements occur in a proper balance and with the right amount of intensity, one finds a religion with a better way to salvation. So one can be a reductive equality pluralist or a reductive degree pluralist with regard to any of a variety of values that are attributed to some group of religions. A non-reductive pluralist, on the other hand, will hold that some value may be present in different religious traditions for different reasons. Consider three religious traditions, R1, R2, R3. It may be that R1 has the salvation value because of elements E1, E2, and E3, each of which is needed in order for R1 to provide a way to salvation. R2 might have the salvation value because of elements E2, E3, and E4, each of which is needed by R2 to provide a way to salvation. In that case, there would be no common element shared by R1 and R2 that is sufficient in order to provide a way to heaven because each one needs an element that the other one lacks. And maybe there would be another religion, R3, that provides an independent way to salvation by means of elements that aren't found in any of the other religions. This sort of pluralist will be called a non-reductive pluralist because the elements by virtue of which several religions possess some value cannot be reduced to what is shared among them. Needless to say, a non-reductive pluralist may be an equality pluralist or a degree pluralist. Now, one might well find all such discussion of ranking and measuring of elements to be misplaced. Equality and degree pluralisms are not the only options that are available for a religious pluralist. Another way of estimating the possession of some value among several different traditions is to say that that is to say that the amount of the value to be found in each of these traditions is incommensurable with the others. So we can have a reductive incommensurability pluralist or a non-reductive incommensurability pluralist. In either case the incommensurability pluralist will claim that there is some value V that cannot be said to be possessed in an equal degree by several religions nor in differing amounts because the measure of the value is incommensurable with its measure in other traditions. Or it's not the sort of thing that can be measured or described in quantitative terms at all. Now, since believers claim various merits for their own denominations. One might be some sort of pluralist with respect to one such merit and another kind of pluralist with regard to another and reject any kind of pluralism at all with regard to a third value. 
Nevertheless, in most discussions of religious pluralism, the, the values are all kind of lumped together. So I find most discussions of religious pluralism to be really sloppy. Now I'd like to discuss um, motivations for religious pluralism. The late William P. Alston turns to the problem of religious diversity in his book, Perceiving God, in a manner that has set the tone for much of the subsequent discussion in the philosophy of religion, at least philosophy of religion in the analytic tradition. Alston introduces the problem of religious diversity as the most difficult problem for his own view of how religious belief can be reasonable. That is, how religious beliefs are reasonable when they're acquired through Christian mystical doxastic practice, as Alston says. Pra the, the practice of forming beliefs on the basis of a mystical path. The problem Alston sees in religious diversity is, to oversimplify, that people in different traditions have religious experiences that seem to support contradictory religious positions. And when a practice for the acquisition of beliefs, a doxastic practice in Alston's terms, leads to the formation of contradictory beliefs, that's normally pretty good reason for being dubious about the reliability of the practice. For Alston, this problem is very serious since his entire epistemological project in the philosophy of religion is to show that religious belief can be justified in the sense of being based on a reliable uh, belief-forming practice, even in the absence of belief that the traditional proofs for the existence of God are sound or convincing. How can beliefs be formed in a reliable way if they're not backed up by rational proofs? Alston answers when they're backed up by experience. But the problem is that religious experiences seem to conflict with one another. One way to get out of this pickle would be to trim off all the elements of the traditions that are not common to all and allow that there is a reliable justification by religious experience only for the common denominator. If three people look at a sign, but they each say that it has something written on it other than what the other ones read, we might doubt all the readings. But we could at least be justified in concluding that there's a sign and that something's written on it. Alston credits John Hick for working out this sort of pluralistic solution to the epistemological problem of religious diversity, but he finds it contrary to his own purposes. His project is to show how religious beliefs may be reasonably based on religious experience. Hick's project would allow for the justification of religious beliefs only if they're reinterpreted to fit Hick's rather peculiar theological views. Alston concludes his discussion of Hick's pluralism as follows, and I quote, Therefore, since I take my task to be the analysis and evaluation of real-life religious doxastic practices, not the reform or degradation thereof, I will not avail myself of Hick's way out. I will continue to take the major systems of religious belief to be making noumenal truth claims that are logically incompatible with each other. End quote. With these words, Alston joins the ranks of all those who have found fault with philosophical accounts of religious belief on the grounds that the philosophical understanding does not correspond to that of the ordinary believer. 
Alston sees this objection coming, and so he qualifies himself on the same page by saying that he recognizes the importance of analogy and symbol for the expression of religious truth. Alston is, is neither a literalist nor a fundamentalist, although he does argue that it's crucial to religious belief to be able to make some literally true statements about God. He distinguishes his position as a form of realism as opposed to Hick's Kantianism. Regardless of the differences between Hick and Alston over the interpretation of religious language, the examination of their positions provides insight into the motivation for some of the philosophical opposition to Hick's version of religious pluralism, as well as the motivation for accepting it. Opposition is motivated by the idea that Hick's religious pluralism is incompatible with religious realism, with the views of ordinary believers, and that the theory threatens our ability to refer to God. Motivation for accepting this sort of pluralism, naturally enough, may accompany a rejection of religious realism as simplistic, the idea that ordinary believers generally have mistaken theological views, and the idea that reference to God is not as straightforward an affair as reference to the objects of the sensible world. Hick's own motivation for advocating religious pluralism was the conviction that non-Christians could be saved, meaning that they could enter heaven without becoming Christians. Since Hick considered salvation for non-Christians to be incompatible with the idea that Christianity alone is true in all claims in which it stands contradicted by some other creed, he sought a way to allow all the major traditions to be equally valid responses to the ultimate. Hick and many others who have been attracted to some version of religious pluralism have expressed the view that pluralism may provide a basis for religious toleration that is not found in traditional views. It is suggested that exclusivist views lend themselves to bigotry. So there's a moralistic flavor to the advocacy of pluralism. Numerous Christian writers have argued against Hick that what motivated him to adopt pluralism does not provide a good logical argument for doing so. First, there's the idea that pluralism provides a theological grounding for toleration. This may or may not be true, but it does not imply that the only possible grounding for toleration is some form of religious pluralism. Exclusivist Christian writers have defended religious toleration while maintaining exclusivist claims about religious truth and or salvation. The fact that fanatics have used exclusivist claims to justify violence against others does not imply that the fault lies with exclusivism. Sometimes a religious pluralism of one sort or another is defended on the grounds that some candidate for the essence of religion is proposed, which is allegedly present in all the great traditions. Wayne Proudfoot has argued that this sort of maneuver is articulated in the works of William James to the effect that although religions might be different in their institutions and doctrines, it is associated religious feelings that constitute the essence of religion, and such feelings are universal. Proudfoot argues that the sorts of feelings to which James appeals are just as diverse as the doctrines that divide the denominations. Well, maybe not quite that diverse, but diverse enough to scotch any hopes that an underlying unity of religions could be secured by that route. 
Proudfoot argues that because our descriptions of doctrines are more articulate than our descriptions of feelings, the illusion is created that there's a uniformity of religious feelings across denominational borders that does not match the diversity of creeds. In fact, however, religious experiences and feelings are just as much colored by cultural factors and training as statements of creed, and if examined carefully, reveal just as much diversity. Other writers have also observed that the phenomena such as holiness may be so diverse that what counts as saintly in one tradition might not be considered worthy of religious merit at all in another. Another idea is that since what appear to be epistemic peers have disagreed about religion for ages with no resolution in sight, might this itself not be taken as evidence for religious pluralism? It would seem rather odd, however, to think that because believers of different denominations each think that all the others are wrong, we should conclude that they're all right. Finally, one might be led to a form of religious pluralism through religious anti-realism. Anti-realists are not antagonistic toward religion. They are not like the new atheists who claim that religious belief is irrational and or immoral. Religious anti-realists merely claim that religious beliefs do not have any credible metaphysical import. And to interpret religious beliefs that seem to describe a transcendent reality in a metaphysical way is somehow to miss the whole point. The expression of religious belief should be seen instead as markers for a religious way of life. In a religious way of life, from time to time, it's appropriate to give utterance to statements about God and angels, but there's no need to think that this means that there's any sort of reality, ultimate or otherwise, to which these beliefs correspond. The first thing to notice about this position is that it will not help very much to find a rationale for letting people outside one's own faith group into heaven or for soteriological pluralism, pluralism with regard to salvation. Second, it might not help much in efforts to bring about tolerance and peace, for after all, it might be part of a religious way of life to be hostile toward others. At most, anti-realism might be used to justify some sort of religious pluralism about truth claims. However, the price to pay for anti-realism is that one must admit that most religious believers, even the best represent representatives of their traditions, quite literally do not know what they are talking about. Paul Griffiths has argued that a minimal principle of charity will require us to allow that the best representatives of each faith tradition 